13. Anybody mark it? 13. All right. Revelation chapter 1, now verse 13. Now, in the midst of the seven candlesticks. So, uh, I give you a sheet of the seven candlesticks. Now, they're laid out on a typewriter, but they, I should have laid them out in a circle. Should have laid the seven uh, churches out to seven candlesticks. That's what the uh, church, uh, candlesticks are. They're the seven churches. So you want to have right there when it says in the midst of the seven candlesticks. You want to have verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in the right hand of uh, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest. Now right in verse 20, circle the word R, R, A, R, E, R. Now what are the seven golden candlesticks? The seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. So uh, here he sees the golden candlesticks and in the midst of them, in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, in the midst of the seven churches is what? One like unto the Son of Man. Back up to verse 13. So this is Jesus. And if you laid him out in a circle like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like that, Jesus is in the midst of them. And a candlestick does what? It shines light. Shines light on to Jesus Christ. So the seven churches are bearing witness of Jesus Christ. The lights are shining on him. He's a sinner. He's walking in and amongst the seven churches. Now, to, so you'll know for certain that this is Jesus Christ. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 2 and look at verse 18. The church of Thyatira. Revelation chapter 2 and pick up uh, verse 18. Uh, the church of Thyatira. And unto the angel of the church... Of Thyatira right. These things saith. Now he, he talks to all seven churches out of way. Christ speaks to ever seven, all seven churches. Now watch it. Uh, these things saith. Now underline it. The Son of God. See that? The Son of God. So no doubt about who Revelation chapter 1 uh, verse 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 is, it's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Uh, now, the problem comes with that word, back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 13. The problem comes with the word like. Like. When you say something is like something, then you're not saying that it's exactly like it. But it's awful close, brethren. Now, the difference is, Jesus Christ is gone 2,000 years, from the time that John sees him on the Isle of Patmos. John saw him. John uh, was uh, one of his disciples and lived with him. So John, seeing Jesus Christ back here on the Isle of Patmos in, in uh, his lifetime, and then he's brought forward up to this time here, and so he sees Christ after 2,000 years of the church age. So you see Christ up in the future. Now, look at him. He is what? He's clothed with a garment down to the foot and girded about the pups with a golden girdle. So it's around here like this. And it's a golden girdle. So he has on a, uh, a garment that goes down to the feet and it's kind of a vest like, a golden vest over this part of him. Now, verse uh, 14. His head and his hair were white like wool. Now, uh, in your notes... Uh, you should have a cross-reference for in Psalm Solomon. Uh, his hair is uh, no longer uh, black as a raven. It's, it's what? It's white like wool. White like wool. Now, Psalm Solomon chapter 5. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Psalm Solomon and look at Jesus Christ as he was a Jew on this earth and... Uh, had uh, jet black hair. Uh, Psalm Solomon, chapter 5. 
And uh, let's pick up verse, uh, uh, what, what verse do I have down there? Verse, let's pick up verse 10. My beloved is white and ruddy, and chiefest among ten thousand. His he uh, head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. Underline that, black. And that's what a Jew's hair would be. Jew's hair would be black. And that's what Jesus Christ is. He's uh, a Jew on this earth. But when you get way over there in the book of Revelation after 2,000 years, the hair is white. And I'm sure the, the hair is white because of after 2,000 years of dealing with God's people, uh, it would turn your hair white too. <laughs> Come on, folks. So Jesus is at the throne, uh, intercession and prayer for you and me, and he sees some of his saints, and for sure, after dealing with them and bawling and crying and weeping back and forth with them, I'm sure his hair has turned white. But it'd be quite a sight, it'd be quite a sight. And this is his glorified body, his glorified body. Back to Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1. Uh, as white as snow, in his eyes, now watch his eyes, his eyes were as the flame of fire. Now meditate upon it. You're talking about Jesus. This is talking about Jesus Christ. He had the eyes. If you look at him, you'd say, man, them eyes burn right through you. Look at you, boy, and you look right through you, boy. They, uh, look at you, and boy, just like a flame going through you. The eyes were as, underline the word as, a flame of fire. That's what they're like. He's describing them. Now, uh, there's, there's a cross-reference, uh, Psalm Solomon chapter 5, verse 12, his eyes on this earth. Psalm Solomon chapter 5, verse 12, and uh, notice uh, if you had walked around with him for the three and a half years of his ministry, he, he would have a different, uh, different set of eyes if you looked at him. You could describe him this way. Solom Solomon chapter uh, 5, verse uh, 12. 5.12? Is that right? Okay. His eyes were as the eyes of what? Doves. Now, doves' eyes are what? Gray. They're gray. Doves' eyes are gray. But he's describing them, see? That would be tender, compassionate, gracious. That'd be like a lamb. Like a lamb. So in his lifetime, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Now, at the second coming of Christ, where we're at over here at the Advent, he's no longer a lamb. What is he, brethren? He's a lamb. So his eyes are like fire. His eyes are like fire. All right. Uh, you could also describe him like a lion. The eyes of a lion. But it, it's, it's his eyes. It just After being around for 2,000 years, that's a long time, brethren. Well, Jesus Christ has actually been around longer than that. He's the be he has no beginning and no ending. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He has no ending and no beginning. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 15 now. His feet, talking about Christ's feet, way up in, in around the time of the rapture and the time of the advent. His feet likened to fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. They don't burn in a furnace, they just look like that. Now, what does brass look like when it burns in the furnace? Now, that would be something they, anybody know, Dave? A red with a goldish tint to it. That's what it looked like. And his voice, his voice has the sound of many waters. That would be like a Niagara Falls. Many waters. That would be like a huge waterfall that's coming down. Just It would just uh, shake you, boy. If you heard the voice, you would go, you would freeze. The hair would come up on the back of your neck is what would happen. Sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Now what are those seven stars? Verse 20. The seven stars. The seven stars. Right in the middle of verse 20. The seven stars. What's that next word? Are. A-R-E. What are they? They are the angels of the seven churches. So with each church, there's an angel. And these stars represent an angel. So in the Bible, in the Bible, 
uh, angels. T take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And uh, watch this uh, one of these angels that's described as a star. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Now watch this star, this angel. And I saw an angel. There it is, an angel. He said, I saw it. It's like he's watching a movie. It's like he's watching a screen. The Lord just shows him the whole thing as it goes along. Shows him this, shows him this, shows him this. And he says, and I saw. You don't see the whole thing at once. He just sees it as the Lord shows it to him. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key, keys at the bottom of his pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit. Now, I thought there was a star there connected with that angel. Well, I don't see it, but I thought there was a star connected with it. Uh, well, turn to Revelation chapter 9 and look at verse 1. Revelation 9, 1. Revelation 9, 1. Revelation 9, 1. Uh, that's why I went to Revelation 20. Revelation 9, 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw, like he's watching a movie, I saw a star. S-T-A-R. Now watch what happens. A star fall from the heaven and the earth. And to him, that star, was given the keys of the bottomless pit. And he, that star, opened the bottomless pit. See that thing? So he's an angel. He is the, he's the angel and he has the keys and he opens the bottomless pit. And the same thing happens in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. That angel has the keys of the bottomless pit. Uh, and I saw an angel come down from heaven. He had the keys of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So the star is an angel. Star is an angel. All right, Revelation chapter one now, and uh, verse uh, fifteen, verse sixteen. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Now out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now underline that. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, what would be the two-edged sword? The Word of God. Okay, now take your Bible and turn to Hebrews. And spiritually speaking, turn to Hebrews chapter 4. And out of his mouth proceeded a two-edged sword. Hebrews, I mean, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Spiritually speaking. Hebrews 4, 12. And the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So spiritually speaking, you'd say the sword that come out of Jesus' mouth was a uh, was the word of God. But now, technically, where we're at in the book of Revelation, uh, doctrinally, it's not the word of God, but it's Revelation chapter 19. So uh, take your uh, Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 19 and watch the two-edged sword. Watch the sharp sword. It says in, uh, uh, and out of his mouth went a uh, sharp two-edged sword. Revelation chapter 19, and let's pick up verse, uh, let's pick up verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. His eyes were the flame of fire. Underline that. His eyes are the flame of fire. You just read that in Revelation chapter 1. So his eyes are the eyes of who? Verse in front of it, the eyes of a judge, not a priest. Now how many of you have a cross-reference Bible that say this describes a priest? Anybody have a uh, cross-reference Bible? 
down on the margin or in the margin or down at the margin says this is describes the priest Jesus Christ the priest no no it's not Jesus Christ the priest it's who it's Jesus Christ the judge the king who's coming to judge so you want to write that down it's not describing a priest them uh, them eyes of the flame of fire that's describing a judge and you just read the cross reference revelation chapter 19 verse uh, 11 righteous do judge and make war now hold your hand there to prove to you that this uh, is not describing a priest turn to proverbs chapter 20 it not all the commentaries i don't know why they they got on this idea of saying that was a priest and described him as a priest, high priest. And I don't know why they, they did that, but it's not the case. They're descri uh, the Lord's describing a judge. Now, uh, Proverbs chapter 20, and look at verse 8. Proverbs chapter 20, and look at verse 8. He's, he's a priest back in the church age, but not at the advent. Uh, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 8 says, now watch it, a king, uh, he's a king at the advent. He's not a king back in the church age, he's what? He's a priest back in the church age. A king that sitteth in the throne of judgment scatters away all evil, now watch it, with his eyes. With his eyes, that's Revelation chapter 20 verse 11. So his eyes are the eyes of the flame of fire. So he's describing a judge, a king as a judge. All right, Revelation chapter 20 now. Let's, let's read on. Uh, the judge and make war. His eyes were as the flame of fire. Revelation chapter 1, we just read it. And on his head were many crowns. We'll talk about that later. And he had a name written that no man know but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. We'll talk about that later. And his name shall be called the Word of God. So this is Jesus. Now watch it. And armies. Somebody's following him. This is the advent. Second advent. This is Armageddon. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen and white and clean. Now watch it. Here it is. Verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. So at the second coming of Christ, at the advent, when he destroys all the armies of the world, watch what happens. That with it he should smite the nations. So that sword that comes out of his mouth kills 200 million people. Man, that's a sword, boy. That's a sword. And he shall rule them with a the rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying unto the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together into the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, because they're all dead. And the flesh of horses, because they're dead. And them that uh, sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bound, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him uh, that set on the horse and against his army. And the uh, uh, beast was taken and with uh, him the false prophet uh, which worketh miracles before him which he deceived them that dwell on and maketh the uh, mark of the beast in them that worship his image. They both were cast alive uh, in, uh, in, in a lake of fire burns with brimstone. There it is. That's Armageddon. Armageddon. Back to verse 15. And out of his mouth. So when Jesus Christ returns on that white horse with the armies of, the wor of, of his own armies following him and he's getting ready to fight uh, 200 million people, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. He cuts them all up. He slices them to pieces. Into it, just slices them all up, and the blood runs down through the valley of Megiddo, two feet deep. That's a sword, boy. That's a sword. Yes. 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 Exactly. It's just exactly like that. It's where the Lord speaks something, and out of His mouth speaks it. 
He spoke in creation the galaxies. God spoke the galaxies into creation. Look at Hebrews. Look at the book of Hebrews showing you that the galaxies are created by God speaking. Jesus Christ speaking. That's His power. He has some power, boy. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter... Uh, Uh, oh no, that's a little different. That's not the one I wanted. That's, but it's there somewhat. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Who being the brightness of His glory. Hebrews 1 3. What did I say? It don't matter. Hebrews 1 3 is what I want. <laughs> Who being the brightness of His glory. And the express image of His person. That's Jesus Christ. Now watch this. And upholdeth. What does it mean to uphold something? Upholding. That's hold it together. The Lord holds everything together. He holds it together. You know what holds your car together? The Lord does. You know what holds your body together? The Lord does. You know what holds your house together? The Lord does. And when the Lord says, let it break, boy, it's going to break. Now watch it upholdeth all things by the word of His power. So ask the Lord to keep your car together. You want the thing to last a long time? Say, Lord, it's falling apart. Let me, let me go a ways on it. Lord, please hold it together. I do it all the time. I do it all the time. All right. Uh, now that's not the one I want, but there's another one that talks like Chuck said, yes. Revelation 19. Go ahead. Verse 20. And the beast was taken. That's the Antichrist. That's the Antichrist. That's another one. It's a satanic trinity. It's a satanic trinity made up of... Well, I'll give you a cross-reference. Go to chapter 11 of Revelation. Go to chapter 11. And you'll see that there's a satanic trinity. One is the devil, which is a dragon. The beast, which is the antichrist. And then the false prophet. There are three of them, a satanic trinity. And to see this false prophet, look at uh, Revelation chapter 11. Uh, let's pick up... Uh, well, I say not 11, it's 13. Revelation chapter 13, uh, verse, uh, verse 11. Revelation 13, 11. Now the beast, which is the Antichrist, is in 13, 1. And I stood upon the sands of the seas and saw a beast, that's the Antichrist, a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was, was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of the bear, and his mouth was the mouth of the lion, and the dragon, that's the devil, the dragon's the devil, gave him his power. So in Revelation 13, 1 and 2, that's the Antichrist himself as a man. Now... In Revelation 13, 11, here's the false prophet, which is another person of the Satan Trinity. Like there's a Trinity of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Those are three, two, three different pre persons of the Trinity. Now here's a Satanic Trinity, verse 11. And I behold, underline that word right there, another, right there, Revelation uh, 13, 11, another beast come up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. So this, this is the false prophet. And he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast. He had the power of the Antichrist. 
uh, before him and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he uh, doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven. This is a false prophet. And he's, he's, that's what he's called, the false prophet. And he's another part of the satanic trinity. Uh, fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man to deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life. That's, this is the false prophet in verse 15. He has power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bound, to receive a mark in the right hand or in the forehead, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the name of the beast, that's the Antichrist, number of his name, where is wisdom, and so on. There through the passage. So there's three of them. There's the, Antich there's the Antichrist, who's a man. And then he's a devil incarnate, like Christ would be. And then there's the devil, which is a dragon, seven-headed dragon. He's found in Revelation chapter 12, uh, 7. No, have you, no, no. Have you ever seen God, the Father? So you can't see the devil. But you will see the Antichrist. Did you see Christ? No, you didn't see him. But if he was here, you'd have saw him. You follow me? You'd have saw Christ walking around. Nobody's ever seen God the Father. But you can see Christ. Can you see the Holy Spirit? No, you can't. But in this case, you can see the false prophet. The false prophet is a type of the Holy Spirit. The Antichrist is a type of Jesus Christ. The dragon is a type of God the Father. It's a satanic trinity. There are still two different people. The, the false prophet and the Antichrist are taken right here at the end of the tribulation. We're in Revelation 19. And they're thrown in the lake of fire. The devil is chained up in the bottomless pit at the beginning. He's in the bottomless pit. The Antichrist and the false prophet are in the lake of fire. At the end of the millennium, the Antichrist, I mean the dragon is cast into the lake of fire where the false prophet and the Antichrist are at. Revelation chapter 20. Look at it again. Revelation chapter 20. And watch the devil go into the lake of fire where the Antichrist and the false prophet have been for a thousand years. Okay, Revelation chapter 20 now. Uh, okay. Um, uh, get your pencil and write it out this way. I'll come back to that verse in a minute. You have a holy trinity. The holy trinity is one. God the Father. God the Father. Two, God the Son. That's Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you have God, the Holy Spirit. Is that right? S-P-I-R-T? S-P... No, it's not close enough. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit and I want to get it right. S P what? I R I T. It's the Holy Spirit. If it's the Holy Spirit, I want to get it right. Amen. It's uh, God the Spirit. Acts chapter five. Acts chapter five. Uh, the Holy Spirit is called God. Acts chapter five. The first five verses of the of the chapter. Acts chapter five, verse one, two, three, four, five, six. Calls the Holy Spirit God. He said, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. You have lied to God, Peter says. So Holy Spirit's God. Jesus Christ is a God. There's all kinds of verse proving Jesus Christ is God. 
the whole Bible, the Bible's plumb full of verses showing Jesus Christ is God. And then God the Father. And that's clear throughout Scripture. That's a trinity. That's a trinity. That's separate people. That's separate people, but they're in one. Just like I'm a trinity. I'm not just one. You see my body. You could see Jesus Christ's body. But I have a spirit, so there's a Holy Spirit. You can't see the Holy Spirit. And there's God the Father. That's my soul. So the soul. I have a soul. I have a body. And I have a what? Spirit. I'm a trinity. I'm not two. I'm three. I have a body, soul, and a spirit. Now, the satanic trinity is the seven-headed dragon, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, 1 through 3. 1 through 3. He's a seven-headed dragon. Matches God the Father. Seven-headed dragon. Revelation chapter 12. He has seven heads. All right. Then there's the beast, which is the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Verse 1 and the last part. But basically, verse 1, 2, and 3. And to show you that he's a man, look at the last verse in the chapter. Somebody read me the last verse in the chapter of Revelation chapter 13. Of a man. A man. Number of the beast. It's a number of a man. The Antichrist is a man. He's going to profess to be Jesus Christ. Then there is Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. There's the false prophet. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. On for a few verses, three or four of them. Right there, that's a false prophet. He matches the Holy Spirit. There's your satanic, satanic trinity. Probably, probably be born as a baby and grow up and live and be a man. Pardon? Maybe. Probably. Could be here. Don't know. You, you gotta, you, you gotta say what you know and what you don't know. <laughs> maybe. And what do you mean, maybe? Maybe. I mean, just that, maybe. I don't know. No, he doesn't. He doesn't have a mark. Now there's three of them. Turn to Revelation chapter uh, 13 again. There's three things. One, two, three. There's three things that are involved. In Revelation chapter 13. Notice there's three things. Uh, let, I'll show you Revelation chapter 13 and look at verse. Uh, 17, that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark, that's one thing, or the name, that's another thing, or, or the number of his name. Now, what's, the, what's his number? Here in his wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. What's the number of the beast? His number is what? For it is number of a man, and his number is. What's the number of the Antichrist? His number is what? His number, his number is 666. Six, six. That's his number. That means that's his number. Now, at the, folks are going to have a number. We're going to come down to you being a number. That's what it's going to come down to. Come down to you being a number. They're going to do away with all this other stuff and say, well, how are we going to... You know how it's going to do. A bunch of crooks are going to take you a card and take money out of your bank and take your account. And they say, what in the world are we going to do? Well, if everybody had a number right in the back of your hand, there wouldn't no, nobody steal your money out of the thing and you go up and get your grocery, you just take your hand and you put it right over top of that little machine and keep right on going. Or you have a number across your forehead. All you do is you just lift your head up like that and take off your hat and look at it and that machine goes, chee -chee -chee. Your number goes back to the bank, take all your money right out of the bank. Nobody steals any money out if you got your number. And what if it's invisible, nobody can even see it? 
What if the number's there and it's invisible and you can't even see it? And you don't worry about it because you're not worried about how you look because it's an invisible number anyway. And the machine just walks up there and says, your, your groceries, there's your money, there it is. You keep right on going. And nobody knows your number but the machine. It, it is exactly right. So it's one of the three. It's one of these three. The number, and that's your number, a whole bunch of different numbers, and a mark, and a name. Now, we, won't, we can't get into all that tonight. We have to get into that later. <laughs> Let's go back to Revelation chapter uh, 1. <laughs> Revelation chapter 1. That's the best I can do. We'll have to get into the rest of that later. Revelation chapter 1. Uh, now, verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a what? Sharp, two-edged sword. Then what is that? It's a warning to the tribulation saint. You better watch it, you better watch it, you better watch it. Because you better be ready. There's going to be a tarp, sharp, two-edged sword come out of his mouth to destroy the armies of this world. He's saying to the tribulation saint, endure to the end, make sure you're on the right side and stay on the right side. See that, folks? See that? And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now look at uh, another one of those churches. Look at one of those churches where he said he's going to fight with them with that sword. Uh, let's look at uh, one of those uh, one of those churches at the end, look at uh, Revelation chapter 2 and look at verse 16. Revelation 2.16. Watch it. Revelation 2.16. Now he says to the church, 2.16 is to what church? Pergamos. Pergamos. Now 2.16. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against you with what? Now underline it. Fight against them with the sword of my mouth. See, that's Revelation chapter 20. That's Armageddon. So what's he doing? He's warning that church, you better stay right and better get right, or your life will be on the wrong side. I'm going to come and fight with you. Fight with you what? Fight with you with the sword of my mouth. It's not the word of God. You'd have to spiritualize it to make it the word of God. It ain't the word of God. It's that two-edged sword coming out of his mouth at the battle of Armageddon. Y'all see it? Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Uh, the sharp sword uh, and his countenance. His countenance. And the countenance is, is what he looks like. His face, his appearance. His face. His countenance was as the sun which shineth in his strength. The sun that shineth in his strength. So the sun that shineth in his strength, now you, it should have a, uh, in your notes, it says it's countenance as the sun. That's going to be what? Malachi chapter 4. If you'll remember Malachi chapter 4, in case you don't remember Malachi chapter 4, let's turn to Malachi chapter 4 and watch the S-U-N. That's why here it says his countenance. His countenance was as the sun. Malachi chapter 4. This is the advent. Here's Armageddon again. Uh, Malachi chapter 4, verse... Uh, i got too many pages here. i got to find chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. Malachi 4, 1. For behold, a day cometh, saith, uh, shall burn, underline the word burn, burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, shall be stubble, and the day shall come, and shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the sun, S-U-N, S-U-N, not S-O-N, S-U-N, the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up upon the cleave of the stool, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the sole of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of, now watch it, Moses, 
He's one of the two witnesses there in Revelation chapter 11. Moses, my servant, whom I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments, behold, I will send you, now here's the other one, Elijah. So you have Elijah going up in the whirlwind, and you have Moses. Those are the two witnesses. Uh, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers and children, the hearts of the children of the father, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. All right, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. So it's S-U-N, shining in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying to me, Fear not. And like that, that's a great thing. He's always saying that. The Lord's always saying, Fear not. Fear not. The Lord don't want you to be afraid. He don't want you to be afraid and all frustrated. So fear not, brethren. The Lord will take care of you. Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Underline that. He was dead. He come back alive. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So underline that. So Jesus Christ has the king keys of hell. The keys of hell. And so I give you some cross references there. Uh, somewhere in your notes. That hell has what? Hell has a place, has gates, that you need to open the gate with a key. So hell has a gate, and you have to go through the gate and open the gate. You should have Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and Jonah chapter 2. So Jesus Christ uh, has those keys of death and hell. Now verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the thing which are, we've talked about that verse several times, and the things which shall be hereafter. It shows you the division of the book of Revelation. We've talked about that several times. The mystery of the seven, uh, seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden, my right hand, that Jesus Christ is talking, my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks and the seven stars are, we've gone across it, the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which I sawest are the seven churches. Now, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, going into the first church. Here is the church of uh, Ephesus. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Jesus Christ is talking. Who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He walks in the midst of them. Now, verse 2. I know thy works. Underline that. I know thy works. It goes both ways. He's warning them because he knows their works. But let's spiritualize it and put it on a Christian. The Lord knows what you're doing. The Lord knows your works. Christian, the Lord knows your works. But that goes good and bad. So if you're working, the Lord knows it. You know, it doesn't matter if anybody else knows it. He knows you know, that you're working. He'll reward you. Uh, yes, in verse 1, he's, ta he's the one that's talking. Uh, no, why would you think it was the Holy Spirit? Well, you, you can't separate the Trinity. But this is actually Jesus Christ. This one here. We're, we're in heaven. Yet, judgment seat of Christ. Well, that's the thing. Uh, take your, uh, the, the Lord's universal. The Lord's everywhere. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. The Holy Spirit is here in the tribulation. Christ is there and God's there. But when you go to talking about the Trinity, you're talking about three separate persons, but you're, you're talking about one person, and you're talking about something that's universal. You can't pinpoint Jesus Christ and say he's just here. He's in more places at the same time. One time he's on earth and he's up at the heaven at the same time. Because he's God. You can't, you can't, uh, that's the mystery of the Trinity. You can't get into that. But this is Christ. This is Christ and he's talking to the seven churches in the tribulation. Alright, verse 2. 
I know thy works. Now I'm going to spiritualize it to a Christian. The Lord knows what you're doing if nobody else does. Now think about that a minute. Other people don't have to know what you're doing. If the Lord knows what you're doing, praise God, man, He's going to take care of it. But He also knows if you're not doing anything. So uh, don't kid yourself. You say, how is that? Here's a fellow who hadn't read his Bible for six months and is sitting there by his lampstand. He says, I know thy works. Lord knows you ain't read your Bible for six months. Who are you trying to kid? Lord knows what you're not doing. So it goes good and bad. Thy labor, you're sweating. And thy what? Patience, underline the word, folks. Patience, patience. He's bragging on them. He's bragging on them. He's saying, I know you're patient. I know you're patient. Uh, that's good. That's good. Be patient. Uh, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. He's bragging on them. He said, you know, good thing about you folks, you can't stand those folks that are evil. That's a good attribute as a Christian, is you can't stand some folks that are evil. Now, can you stand some folks that are evil? You shouldn't. I know you ought not like it. You know, you ought to just yes, you ought to grit your teeth. Say that ain't right. Underline it. How thou canst not bear them which are evil. It's righteous indignation, all right. But it's a hatred for sin. You know what's wrong with Christians? They don't hate sin. And thou hast tried them that say, you underline the word try, you try them, you put them to a test. Them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. Now, you've got to have a key verse. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. You've got to try them, and this will go for a church age saint as well as a tribulation saint. It'll go with Quitner anywhere, but it's aimed at a tribulation saint. But it'll go for you too. Anybody says he's an apostle. Now, the whole bunch of folks say they're apostles. You know, they go around here, they get on bicycles, and they ride around with bicycles and tie on a white shirt. <laughs> Come on, folks. <laughs> they say they're apostles. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and look at verse 12. Now, if a man says he's an apostle, you can try him, and you can find out if he's lying or not. Uh, turn to Mark, uh, turn to another verse. Turn to Mark chapter 16. Get Mark 16 in one hand and 2 Corinthians 12, 12 in the other hand. And this is how you try a fellow that says he's an apostle. You put him to the test. All right. First of all, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 says, Truly the signs of an apostle were right among you in all presence and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Then if a fellow is an apostle, he's going to have some signs, if he's an apostle. Now, what are the signs of an apostle? Mark chapter 16, and let's see the signs of an apostle. A real sure enough sign. The fellow says, I'm, a, I'm an apostle. Well, you should go and flat have the signs then. And if you don't have the signs, you're a liar. You're a liar. <laughs> Try it out on the next time the guy has this little tag on that says an apostle on it. <laughs> See if he has a sign. Oh, yeah, he is. Sure is. But if a fellow says he's an apostle, you, you say, okay, you're an apostle. Give me the signs. I want to find out if you're lying or not. Follow me? Now, Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 16. You're absolutely correct. Signs are for the Jews. But some folks profess to be apostles when they're not apostles. About hundreds of thousands of them all over America. They come out of Salt Lake City. <laughs> Mark chapter 16. And let's pick up verse 17. Mark chapter 16 verse 17 says, And these signs, circle the word, S-I-N-G-S, signs shall follow them. I see it, twelve apostles shall follow them that believe in the name, and they shall cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues, and they shall take up serpents, serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, 
and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, what are they going to do? They're going to have some signs of being able to pick up a rattlesnake and it not bite them and not kill them. They're going to have a sign of going by there and touching a fellow and bringing him back from the dead. They're going to have the signs of being able to heal a fellow. Real enough, sure enough, heal him. Now, I'm not talking about this phony baloney stuff where they say this guy got healed and you can look at the guy and, and, and not tell a thing was wrong with him. I went to a healing meeting one time and I went to it to find out whether those folks were real or not. And I sat right on the front, right on the front bench, right on the front bench, right up front. And uh, a guy come in there with a camera and he put this camera on me and puts the camera right at me and I looked at him and said, that guy's trying to take my picture. So I went like this. And he clicked the picture and he walked over a little bit further and I said, that guy's still trying to take my picture. So I went like that. And I said, what's that guy going to take my picture for? Oh, bug me. And finally, I saw that he got my picture. So I said, okay, you got my picture. Go on. Leave me alone. And, and the guy walked out. And uh, pretty soon, uh, the guy up at the platform was saying, now, uh, there's nobody here, nobody here that we believe that is against us. But I want to tell you about a fellow one time that used to work for us that was a crook and stole money from us and was a thief. And his name was Nathan Bemis. And I mean, there's 500 people in this tent and a revival full of citizens, and I just about fell off the pew. I said, man, what did they, they say me for? Man, well, I didn't do nothing. Huh? Me? I about putting her fell off in the ground. And I thought, man, alive, these guys, these guys are professional crooks, boy. They really got something here. And so this guy kept going, preaching on. He had the mic there, and he come down off of the podium. And he says, if anybody don't believe that uh, I can heal, come on up here and I'll show you I can heal. I stood up and says, I don't believe you can heal. Well, about 500 people didn't bother me. I walked up there, and that guy gave me the mic. That was his mistake. <laughs> I grabbed that mic like that, and he gave it to me. And I took the mic, and I stepped over here, and I said, Heal that guy right there in the chair. And that guy was up there like that in that chair like this. And he was twisted up. And those hands were twisted all the way up in the bottom. And he wasn't faking it. You could tell he wasn't faking it. What that guy did? That guy grabbed that microphone out of my hand and said, Let's sing, everybody. And everybody started singing. And two seconds later, these bouncers come in and grab me on this side and this side and carried me out on my tiptoes. <laughs> my feet weren't even touching the ground, boy. They carried me right straight out of there and got outside, and I had a tie on, and this guy took that tie and put that tie right up into my throat just like that and choked me. I thought I was going to stop breathing. And I said, you guys don't act much like Christians. <laughs> you got to stretch, man. you got to get something out of there. They're about to hammer you, you know. <laughs> and uh, the one guy said, who told you I was a Christian? I said, I'm sorry, I apologize. I thought you were a Christian. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you were a Christian. I apologize. <laughs> and I got my finger up there and got that thing out of there. And I said, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm never coming back. I'm never coming back. I'm leaving. And they said, okay, get out of here and don't ever come back. And I walked around there and walked around the tent, walked around the back of the tent. And I saw a great big old truck out there. And I walked around and walked up in that truck. And you and I saw on the back of that truck a bunch of computers. A whole bunch of computers back in that truck. Just loaded, plumb full of computers. And I said, they got my picture, and they got my name, and they know I was in this tent, and they put it on this computer, and they got my name, and that's why they did what they did. They're a whole bunch of first-class crooks. And they couldn't heal anybody. And a couple months later, I got in, the, got in with another one of those guys. <laughs> and I went to the healing meeting, and after the meeting was over, I said, uh, did you ever heal? Uh, it, did you know that Apostle Paul was never healed? He was sick and he never got healed. And he said, uh, no, he got healed. And I said, no, he didn't. And he said, uh, I said, here's my Bible. Show me that in, that, in my Bible if, the, if Paul ever got healed. And he said, come back tomorrow night and I'll, I'll show you. So I went back the next night. And oh, it was a terrible mess. And this woman was getting healed. And she's walking through the healing line. She's getting healed. And that guy got up there and laid his hands on her and said, she's healed. And she took five steps and dropped over dead. She died. Right on the spot. She dropped over dead. 
and there was a newspaper man there. And the newspaper man come in and he took a picture of that woman laying there dead. And when they, when he took a picture of her, those guys come along and beat that newspaper fella up. That was a mistake. A big mistake. Because that guy went down there and put it on the front page. I got beat up. They just did this and this and ripped my camera up, me up and tore everything and put the picture right on the front page and say, I took a picture of the woman that just got healed and she dropped dead. Five police cars were in front of that tent the next night and they threatened him and he had to leave town. That night he left town. I mean, five police cars made him leave town. That was a great Holy Spirit revival fella. <laughs> and after seeing that, I thought to myself, you know what those guys are? They're nothing but first class crooks. But the Lord can do what? He can heal folks. Now those fellows that got a sign that can heal folks, they're the real kind. But those fellows that can't heal somebody and bring them back from the dead and can't pick up a rattlesnake and hadn't got any signs, he is a liar. So try them and test them. One of those uh, Mormons come along to you sometime or another and say, I'm an apostle. Say, give me a sign if you're an apostle. Give me a sign. Let's see you heal somebody. Say, uh, here's a rattlesnake. Let's see if you can keep it in your pocket for a day or two. And they haven't got a signs. They ain't got a bit of signs. You know why? Because they're liars. Because they're not apostles. Revelation chapter 2. And Revelation chapter 2. And verse 2 it says, uh, Say they are apostles and are not. And has found them liars. Let's quit it. Uh, verse 3. Alright. Revelation chapter 2. Verse 3, somebody mark it. All right, prayer request. Let's not forget to pray for sharing. All right, pray for Louise's aunt. Pray for that lady that works at Penny's. Her husband died. I pray God I'll be gracious to her. Okay, what else do you need to remember him for? Don't forget I'll be preaching down at John at the revival here in a couple of weeks. Pray that the Lord will lay upon my heart the right messages to preach. Don't forget for, to pray about John John's wedding. Hey, what else need? Yes. An unspoken? All right. I pray that Anthony people will come by. Now, it's been several years since Anthony's been by, but let's pray that he'll come back to church. Hey, what else do you have to remember him for us? Okay, let's not forget to pray for each one of our missionaries now. All right, what else do you need to remember in prayer? All right. All right. I pray the Lord would save somebody. I pray the Lord give us some visitors. And what else do you need to remember in prayer? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless our prayer meeting tonight. Lord, I pray you'd hear our prayers and answer our prayers, Father, according to your will. And uh, Lord, thank you for those that are here. Lord, give them a blessing, Father. In Jesus' precious name I pray for his sake. Amen.